Now we're going to take a look at more complex pipes. So we are able to handle straight uniform diameter pipes, uh, both for laminin, laminar and turbulent cases, solving for pressure or flow rates, depending on what we know. Uh, but now let's take a look at more complicated systems, more like what you'd see in a, in a real pipe design problem. So there's just a simple example. You've got a tank, perhaps, of water. Uh, you've got a valve here that controls the flow. It goes around a bend, comes to a T. Flow could go down this T. If this valve is open, it could go out this spigot. If this valve is open here, there's an expansion section here where the flow you know, goes into a larger diameter pipe. Obviously, these are just a few examples of the many, many things that could happen uh, with a complicated pipe system, or even a fairly simple pipe system. Every single one of these things is going to uh, cause resistance to the flow. There's going to be resistance to the flow as the flow enters this pipe here through this sharp-edged wall. We saw with flow separation that we would expect for, for any kind of even modest Reynolds number that there would be flow separation as the flow goes around this sharp corner. And that's going to lead to increased drag and it's going to lead to increased friction in the flow. So that's going to resist flow. And of course, valves are going to resist flow. These bends are going to resist flow. Again, it's possible that we'd even have flow separation here. If we had very high Reynolds number flow, we could get flow separation as we go around these bends. But even without that, it's going to change the flow and reduce the and reduce the flow rate or increase the pressure needed to force uh, liquid through this pipe when you have a bend in it. Uh, the T, of course, if you know flow is going to go down this side of the T, you've got another sharp corner here. That's certainly going to induce another set of flow separation, you know, increase uh, resistance. Obviously, the valve again, depending on the type of valve, some valves are pretty neutral when they're fully open. Other valves that we'll see are, are really obstruct flow even when they are fully open. Uh, certainly if the valve is not fully open, that's gonna obstruct the flow. And you know these pipe expansions or contractions also can change the flow, as can the exit. And the mere fact of the water exiting the pipe often can cause uh, you know, problems with, with resistance to flow. So all these things are, are examples of things that can increase flow resistance. For simple pipes, the ones we've studied in the past, for turbulence, we came up with this relationship, which was the delta P plus rho G delta Z was equal to one half rho average velocity squared times the friction factor L over D. And that friction factor, we can look it up on the Moody diagram, or if it's laminar flow, we could look it up. Uh, we could use 64 over Reynolds number. But either way, um, we know how to deal with that now. And it's important to remember that for this definition, delta P is P in minus P out, and delta Z is Z in minus Z out. Um, so that's how we're defining them for these relationships. If you have complex pipes like this, um, if the pipe has a constant diameter, uh, you can write it like this. So this does not have a constant diameter. I've clearly drawn this pipe to be much larger than this. So this would not apply to this pipe yet. We'll come up with a new relationship for that. For one where you have a lot of complicated things happening, valves, bends, whatever, but it's constant diameter, you can rewrite this equation in this way. So you have delta P, rho G, delta Z on the left, just like we did before, one half rho average velocity squared, again, just as we did before, but now we have an additional term. So we have the same F over LD term that is the frictional resistance in the pipe, as we would expect, but now we have the sum of K. So these Ks are called, um, loss coefficients. So the K are loss coefficients. And they there are different loss coefficients for every single kind of thing that exists in the pipe, like bends in the pipes, the valves, all of those things. Um, these Ks are for, uh, for turbulent flow. So right now we're talking about flow that we think is turbulent. And so these, most of the Ks that you're going to find are for turbulent flow. And this relationship that I've written is for turbulent flow. Um, so uh, that's very common in you know, water pipes, as we've seen. Almost all water pipes are turbulent. It's true of oil as well for, the most, case, for most cases. Um, you know, if you have a really viscous fluid like glycerin, you might have laminar flow. But most people weren't very interested in that. There's not a lot of glycerin pumping going along in the world. Um, now that there are people studying microfluidics, people do study laminar flow, and we will touch on that in a later lecture. But most of this theory was developed for, you know, water flow. 
and that you know, gasoline flow. And those things all are going to be turbulent in normal piping situations. So these Ks are our loss coefficients. We might have a lot of them. We might have you know, one for every bend, one for every inlet, one for every outlet. Whatever's in that pipe, you know, complex pipe situation is going to have a lot of these things. How do you get these loss coefficients? They're the same kind of thing as the C sub Ds that we learned externally about for external flow drag. These are things that are determined by experiment. And so people make big tables of them. And like C sub D, they depend on a lot of things. They depend on the Reynolds number sometimes. They depend on if it's a bend in the pipe, it depends on exactly how the pipe is bent. How much is it bent? How is it, is it you know, bent slowly or sharply? Um, the radius of curvature of the, of the thing. What type of valve? All these things matter. So these Ks, there are lots and lots of tables for these. Um, and you have to be very careful to pick out the ones that are, the, are relevant to the problem you're, you're dealing with. All right, so what else do we have? Uh, well, what if we do have varying diameters? We have varying diameters there. So let's take a look at that. So if, if the diameter does vary, or if it is not constant, then we need a different formula. And so that formula looks like this. Same left-hand side, delta P, delta P plus rho G delta Z, same definition of delta P and delta Z. But now we have to account for the fact that there could be different regions of the pipe that have different diameters. And if they're going to have different diameters, they're also going to have different velocities, right? Because we're going to have mass conservation, assuming it's incompressible flow, as all the flows we've been studying in our classes are, in this class are. Then we have to consider the fact that the velocity will change when the diameter changes. So that's going to be one issue. So we have to have, for every different diameter, we're going to have a different velocity. So those are the different sections of pipe. And then that same different velocity affects uh, the uh, compressibility, co the, uh, sorry, the, the, uh, <coughs> so the loss coefficients. So, all right, here's so, so this is what I'm using I for. I is going to refer to all the different possible diameters. So you have one half row out in front. That's the same for all sections of the pipe. The density of the fluid is not changing. It's incompressible. But we might have different, we will have different sections of pipe, each of which might have a different diameter and there might be different lengths so you know so there might be 10 meters that have diameter whatever and 30 meters that have diameter some other whatever so those are those are all different and each of those diameters is going to lead to a different average velocity so that has to be squared and multiplied by this term obviously each of these f's is going to have a different it's going to be a different f for each section of the pipe because you're going to have a different reynolds number for each f why? Because you're going to have a different velocity for each, each section of the pipe. So all the Fs will be different. Also, epsilon over D will be different, assuming the pipe is made of all the same material, even if it is. Well, the diameter is different, so epsilon over D is going to be different. So that's going to give you a different F here. So the different Fs, different Ds, different Ls, all multiplying these different Us. You have to add them all up, and then you have to add up all the loss coefficients, each one, you know, respective to the whatever pipe diameter it's in. So you have to pay attention to which where these where these things are occurring. Is the bend occurring in a large diameter section or a small diameter section? Which U is the right U that goes with that particular uh, feature of the pipe?